Well, good morning, Christ Chapel. Great to see you. If I were to tell you hello, you would know exactly what that meant. You knew that that was a greeting. And if we told many people in our world today, hello, most of them would understand it, but there are some that wouldn't. That got me thinking, what word would the rest of the world recognize? Many people think that the most recognizable word in the entire world is okay. (laughs) The rest of the world gets okay. Everybody understands what okay means. The second most recognizable word in the world, Coke. Everybody knows what Coke means. You can go anywhere and you can just say Coke. They know where to take you. They know exactly where where you want to go, exactly what you want. Now, why do I bring this up? Because where did that all start? How did that become this worldwide brand that everybody knows? Well, it all started on a little street corner in 1886 in Atlanta, Georgia, downtown Atlanta, Georgia, at a little drugstore. John Pemberton had this mixed up, this concoction that he was selling at a drugstore. Now, I know there are some young people going, what in the world is a drugstore? And why is a pharmacist mixing this up? You'll explain that to them later, okay? I'm not gonna do that now. But John Pemberton was mixing up this concoction that he called Coca-Cola. And it was doing very well. It ended up going to other drugstores in the area. He ended up selling his concoction. But then the whole brand, the whole name and recipe were all sold in 1889 for $2,500. $2,500 in 1889. That brand was doing so well as that was sold that some, actually two guys from Chattanooga, Tennessee, in 1901, came to the owners of the Coke brand and said, we want to bottle Coca-Cola. Now, this was unheard of in its day because you only bought Coca-Cola at a drugstore. You only set, you sat down there and it was mixed up for you. Nobody had ever thought about bottling and distributing Coca-Cola. And because that was such a, a foreign thought, these two gentlemen bought the rights to bottle Coca-Cola wherever they wanted to in perpetuity for $1. $1. And they obviously have done very well ever since. Uh, They ended up taking that back and selling off the rights to different regions or to different areas, et cetera. And today, there are 68 independent bottlers of Coca-Cola. If you drink a bottle of Coke, that's come from an independent bottler. The formula, the recipe was sold to them, but they independently bottled it so that they could therefore distribute it. Now, why in the world am I talking about this? It's because what has become a worldwide recognizable brand and name and something we all enjoy started on a street corner in downtown Atlanta 130 years ago. And what we as a church want to do is we want to take something that happened 2,000 years ago on a cross in Jerusalem and make it a worldwide name, a worldwide recognizable brand. Christ is classic. (laughs) Christ is classic. That is what the world wants. That is what the world needs. And he has given us the rights to bottle him, distribute him to anybody we want. (laughs) We can do that in perpetuity and it doesn't even cost us a dollar. You can do it for free. We, as a church, as a local church, have been called and mandated by the Lord himself, who is the head of our church, to distribute his refreshing nature to the rest of the world. It's sweet, it's awesome. And just so you know, this isn't a Coke commercial. If you haven't tried the Dr. Pepper shake at Whataburger, it is awesome, okay? (laughs) It's killer. So I just want you to know, gotta balance it out here, because if you're like, do you have stock in Coke? No, I don't, okay? Anyway, that's what we are called to do. We are called to be distributors of this classic Christ. 
but we do it in our own kind of unique way. As I said, there are 68 bottlers and they all do it a little bit differently. The formula is the same, the recipe is the same, what they distribute is the same, but they all do it a tad bit differently. And so what I wanna do today is I wanna talk about Christ Chapel's classic core values. How do we do what we do? What drives how we distribute distribute, I'm using that loosely, Christ to the world, to those in our neighborhood, to our friends, to our coworkers, to those we want to experience the refreshing nature of Christ. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you Christ Chapel's classic core values. There are eight of them. I, I read this when thinking about that. Uh, well, let me, let me read Hebrews 13, 8 to you, just to be clear, uh, because the formula doesn't change. What we distribute doesn't change. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's, he is the same. The same God, and this is, I just, I don't know, I love this. The same God that people were worshiping, the same Lord Jesus that people were worshiping in churches 2,000 years ago, we are doing the same thing. He, he has that much of an impact on the world that he's impacting us. And we get to do what he commissioned the early church to do. We have the same command. It, it, again, Christ is classic. But I wanna tell you some of the nuances of our church, what are important to us, our values. As I said, I read this quote on values uh, the other day. Values are like fingerprints. Nobodies are the same, but you leave them all over everything you do. Do you know who said that? The king. Not the King Jesus, the King Elvis Presley. <laughs> uh-huh, thank you very much. <laughs> you know, I, okay, I'm gonna take it aside real fast. I'm gonna tell you about an unwritten core value that I believe we have at Crest Chapel, and that's humor. Uh, a lady told me that uh, she walked out of church one day with her son, and her son, I think, was like 11 years old. This was a couple years ago. And her son said to her, if somebody doesn't like to laugh, they shouldn't come to Christ Chapel. <laughs> and I love that. I, that might be my favorite thing that anybody's ever said about our church because, man, following Jesus is not a drag. It, it, there's joy, there's life in following Christ. There's life in living for him and we should enjoy it and we should laugh and we should have fun. And so as we talk about our core values, we're gonna have a little fun and we're gonna talk about it in the way of Coke. And so uh, anyway, these are our classic core values. And the first one is this, challenging every believer to take their next step for continuous spiritual growth. Challenging every believer to take their next step for continuous spiritual growth. I hope this encourages you but doesn't make you narcissistic. You are what we value most. And you say, well, I thought that was Jesus. Yes, okay, gold star. But you growing with Jesus is our highest priority. I mean, what, what good does it do for just Jesus to be our highest priority and for me to come and preach to teach the word to, to stone cold people? It, do, it, does, it does no good. What warms my heart, what gets me up every morning is I want you to take your next step with Christ. I want you to grow closer to him. It's what I pray for, it's what I study for, it's what I love to see. That's what I want. I don't want any glory from that. I want you to fall more in love with Jesus, not in love with me, with him. You see, salvation is not the end of the spiritual life on earth. That's not the end. You say, well, well I got saved, so what, I mean, there's nothing now. I guess I'll just wait for Jesus to take me to heaven. That's not it. You're supposed to continue to grow in your relationship with him. It's so important to us that it's actually our mission statement. In Colossians 1.28, as a church, if, you picked up, if you've ever looked at our constitution, this is in our constitution. Him, meaning Christ, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. We want to present you mature in Christ. How you are presented to Christ in your spiritual maturity reflects on us as a church. Don't fail us. 
God's gonna say, what, what have you been teaching them? How have you helped them grow? How have you matured them? Because we wanna present you mature in Christ. God, because what, what are we supposed to do? We are not to build buildings. We are supposed to build a church, and a church is made up of people. We are building disciples. We are, you are a disciple, and you need to continuously take your next step to grow spiritually, constantly getting fitter, stronger, more mature, spiritually speaking. I don't know how many of you have ever uh, used a, a physical personal trainer, personal trainer like at, at the gym. Uh, if you have, God bless you. If you're, if you're a personal trainer, God bless you, but you are expensive. <laughs> you're super expensive. I'm glad you make what you make. Good. Support your family. I can be your free spiritual personal trainer. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's, what our, that's what our staff is here to do. That's what they're called to do, to say, hey, you know what? You need to exercise your faith in this way. This, these are the exercises that you need to do. This is, this is how you'll grow closer to Christ. This is how you'll build some spiritual muscle. And we're free. Don't go pay those personal trainers. <laughs> we'll, we're, we're here. We're gonna help one another grow. And one of the ways and the main way that we help you grow is through Monday morning relevant biblical teaching for all ages. Monday morning relevant biblical teaching for all ages. That's the way, that is the main means through which you grow is as you interact with the word of God. Now, let me just be very clear. At Christ Chapel, we believe that God's word is inerrant and inspired. This is the foundation for the way that we live, the way that we work, the way that we do ministry, the way that we love one another, the reason why we do certain things and the reason why we don't do certain things. We believe what the Bible says, God says, and what God says, the Bible says. We will always stand on God's word as our foundation. So much so, I love saying this, there is a Bible underneath my feet here in the pulpit that we are always reminding everyone who preaches from this pulpit that we stand on the word of God. We are not going to go the way of culture. We're gonna stand on his word. That's our foundation. This is firm. You can, I, you can clap for that. but I can preach this till I am blue in the face. What I want is for you to apply this to your life because that's what Hebrews 4.12 tells us is that for the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit and joints of joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You see, the word of God changes us. It's living and it's active, which means that it applies to your life on Monday morning. That's why we're gonna preach it in a way where we give you Monday morning application. You can wake up the next day, you can look at your sermon notes and you say, this is how the word of God applies to me as a man, as a woman, as a parent, as a coworker, as a boss, as a whatever. This is what I'm supposed to do because this is what the word of God is telling me as it leads me into the fullness of life with Christ. But it changes us on the inside. I mean, did you notice how it described it? It didn't just say it's living and active. It's living and active to do what? To get inside of us. It's sharper than two. It pierces. It, it, you don't hold the scripture at arm's length. That's not how you grow. You, you let it in. You, you let it change you from the inside out. The word of God is what changes us. It's as we interact with him through the power of the Holy Spirit and we take steps of faith to obey what he's called us to obey in his word. That's how we're going to grow spiritually. And that's why we teach it in every venue. It doesn't matter your age. If you came in this morning and you uh, put, uh, dropped off your child in children's ministry or grandchild in children's ministry, let me be clear, they are not being babysat right now. We do not babysit children at Christ Chapel. We teach children the word of God in an age-appropriate manner, whether that's the volunteers who are rocking babies who are singing scripture or praying over these little kiddos, or as they age up, we're teaching them the word of God. My son's in second grade. He's memorizing scripture. 
I mean, that's what they're doing in the class. And we're gonna do that all the way through. It doesn't matter your age. All the way up to the sages. They're teaching the word of God. Because the word of God is what changes us. And it's Monday morning relevant. It applies to our life today. But the other way that you're going to get some uh, spiritual growth is not just as you take in the word of God, live it out Monday morning, but you live it out by using your spiritual gift. And we want to give you permission when it comes to using your spiritual gift. That's one of our core values is permission giving when it comes to using your spiritual gift. Permission giving. You see, the Bible teaches us that everyone who comes to know Christ has been given a spiritual gift gift. You have been giving some, given something that is so unique to you, and a gift meaning that it comes naturally to you. It comes easily to you because it's d- divinely inspired and empowered that you're supposed to use to encourage and edify the body. That's what 1 Peter 4.10 tells us. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. Use it. We, you all have one, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. This tells me that if you're not using your spiritual gift, then you're not a good steward of God's grace. You are called to use the gift because you are called to steward what you have been given, to use it. And we wanna give you permission Say yes to say, go make much of Christ with the gifts and experiences that you have been given. And I wanna, uh, let me give you an example of what that would look like. Um, These are dear friends, Scott and Lauren McClellan. Some of you know the McClellans. Scott and Lauren usually go to the 915 or the five o'clock service here at the Fort Worth campus. And they've been coming to Christ Chapel uh, for decades now. But about, it was 20 years ago, in 1999, God started doing something in Scott's uh, heart. And I wanna read to you what, what he said uh, because it, it's just, it's profound what this conversation. I'm gonna let you in on his conversation with God back in 1999. He said, God began to convict me that I cared only for my clan or my family. He said, I did little to glorify him and cared less for others. I wrestled with this for up to six months that year, and my struggle came to a climax as I questioned God, what is it that you want from me? So what he asked God back in 1999. I was so confused since I had no tools. Scott said, I had only basic education, was not a teacher or a speaker, and I had a complete lack of biblical knowledge. And I remember exclaiming to the Lord, what in the world would anyone want to hear me talk about? The only thing I knew about back then was archery, fire, sharp weapons, and the wild outdoors. And God spoke to me softly asking, would you give me that? And he decided back in 1999 that he would give the Lord those things. Scott is a master archer, master archer. And so he took those gifts and he started getting involved with these outdoor outreaches. And he started to try to interact with folks that didn't know Christ, but had similar interests, similar affinity for fire and sharp weapons and the the outdoors. And he started getting involved in these different things and building relationships, and some of you have helped him with this. But in 2012, he started his own organization that he, he calls TAG21, uh, to call it an organization. It, I mean, it's, it's, it's a loose gathering of people. And the goal of TAG21 is to introduce Christ to men and their families who might not normally come to church. And so he, he and Lauren, they've, they've literally built things at their house just for TAG21 just for this outreach at their home. And so what happens is the guys come over to their house and they, they literally shoot bows and arrows. And Scott teaches them since he's a master archer. They have a meal, they eat, and then, they, then Scott does a teaching. And he, does, and he lays out the gospel. I think Scott's gift, I actually know it, Scott's gift is the gift of evangelism. 
He has that gift. It's amazing to see uh, what happens in these guys' lives. Well, that was back in 2012. Well, a few years ago, so let's say 2015, 2016, Scott called me and he said, Cody, we've been doing this Tag 21 group and I've got guys that, you know, they've come to know Christ, they wanna be baptized. He was like, how do I, you know, get them into the church or, you know, how do we set that up for them to get baptized here? And I was like, Scott, they don't wanna be baptized by me. They wanna be baptized by you. And he was like, me? He was like, I don't know how to do baptisms. And I was like, I'll teach you how to do baptisms. I said, it's gonna mean far more to those guys if you would do it. I mean, they see you that way in their pastoral role. I said, here's what, here's what we've got, Scott. <laughs> I'm out at, at the time, I was out at the West Campus. I said, Scott, at the West Campus, we have this horse trough. And we fill up this horse trough with water and we do baptisms. What if you came and you picked up this horse trough and you take it to Tag 21 and I'll, I'll teach you through the baptism things and what to say and how to do it and stuff and you start baptizing guys. The baptizing the guys that come to know Christ. That he, Scott certainly sees himself under the authority of our church but we wanna give him permission. And so Scott started baptizing guys uh, in Tag 21. This is Steve Fegley. Steve and uh, Sherry usually come to the 9.15 or five o'clock service uh, as well. And so Scott was doing baptisms. And just to be clear, I gave Scott permission to bring those guys out of the water, um, okay? <laughs> I don't, uh, you know, with this still photo, I don't know if he made it out. But um, I, I hope that he did. He might have met Jesus sooner than he thought he was going to. <laughs> uh, but since Tag 21 started, over 20 guys have come to know Christ and hundreds of impactful decisions on guys' lives and their families have been made because Scott said, Lord, I'll give you fire and archery and the great outdoors. That, that's what I care about. And, and we listen to those stories, and, 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 I, and I, kn I know your heart. Your, your hearts are so sincere, and you go, that's awesome. I mean, that's Scott. Let me tell you, Scott is average. <laughs> he heard me say that at 9.15, and he's like, you're right. <laughs> Scott is special. I, Jen and I love Scott and Lauren with all of our hearts but he's just an average guy like me that just, we, and you that just said yes to Jesus and said, I'll do whatever. Why not you? <laughs> well, it's not about you. It's about stewarding the gift of God's grace that he has given you. It's not him, it's God through him. So why not you? Why, why, why can't he use you to bring people to Christ? Why can't he use you to serve the body? Why not? He can. Don't disqualify yourself because if you disqualify yourself, you're gonna miss out on what God could do miraculously through you that you get to see firsthand. Don't miss out. One of the ways you might see him work is as you interact with and serve the body because one of our core values here is small group participation to spur on life change for everyone involved. Small group participation to spur on life change for everyone involved. We believe that life change best takes place in small groups. It best takes place in community as we live our Christian life around other folks. You were not meant to be a lone ranger Christian. That's not, if you isolate yourself, you're in danger. Every isolated Christian is a vulnerable Christian. You need to be around other believers, not only to get encouragement from them, but also because they're missing out on your gift. <laughs> they're missing out on what you can contribute to that group. None of us are self-sufficient in Christ. We need one another. It's how God has made us to be the body. Hebrews chapter four, uh, 10, verses 24 and 25 says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Don't give up meeting together. It's very easy for us in our lives to get too busy or overscheduled or to, to put Christ or his things or community on the back burner. 
Because we say these things are more important and God is always there. Absolutely, God is always there. But he needs to be in the forefront. I'm telling you, if you put him first, everything else will fall in place. Don't give up meeting together. And we wanna, we wanna give you a touch point of a way that you can get involved with small group community to spur on your life change and other folks' life change this fall as we're gonna kick off a new series beginning the week of September 22nd on the seven churches of Revelation. And I wanna give you a little sneak peek as to what we're gonna be studying. Christ Chapel, I'd like to ask you a question. Have you ever gone somewhere in the world and you just had a wonderful time and you were tremendously impacted by the experiences that you had or, or the place and you can't wait to come back and tell your friends and family all about it and you're spitting out the details to them as fast as you can and you just kind of get frustrated. You, you come to the end of yourself and you just say, you know what, you just need to go there yourself. Well, this fall, we're going to be studying the seven churches of Revelation. And rather than me just spitting out a bunch of details at you, I'd rather you just be there yourself. So come on and let's go. So join us this fall for our series on the seven churches of Revelation. It's going to be an incredible series that I think you'll be able to relate to. Just as the churches were experiencing an unstable political climate, an increasingly secular culture, and an ever increasing pressure to compromise, I think you'll be able to relate. And you'll want to jump in a home group as well where we will see exclusive content that I won't have time to share with you at the Sunday sermons. And throughout the week, we're going to be continuing the conversation with different pastors from our church. It's going to be an incredible series you won't want to miss. So join us this fall for the seven churches of Revelation. This is a, a launching point for you, for some of you to get into a home group to experience this life change. And, and I, what I said, I just want to reiterate, we went over to Turkey and I fil it's modern day Turkey, that's where the seven churches were, and I filmed all the home group lessons there in Turkey. So you in a home group are gonna see Turkey and the sites, ancient sites of the seven churches in a way that you're not gonna be able to see through the sermons. I just don't have time to do it. I'm also gonna be teaching special content in there that I will not talk about from the pulpit. So you need to get into a home group and you can do that today if you'll go up to the link bridge, which I'll remind you to do as soon as we're done. So get in a home group. Uh, today. Uh, one of the things that uh, governs our uh, relationships in those home groups, which is a core value of ours, is grace. And that is allowing grace to govern our relationships as we treat others the way Christ has treated us. Allowing grace to govern our relationships as we treat others the way that Christ has treated us. Grace is the rule, and we just studied Galatians, so I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this uh, because we talked all about God's grace. We're not gonna be legalistic. Uh, we're not also not gonna tolerate license as well. Grace does not equal tolerance. Grace equals forgiveness and equals redemption, and those are the things that we are fighting for. Uh, Romans 15, seven says, therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. You are more than welcome to come as you are, but you are not welcome to stay as you are, nor am I. I have to continue to be sharpened. I need to continue to be conformed into the image of Christ. And ask Jen, I have plenty of rough edges. She would tell, be the first to tell you that, uh, Lord, I hope Cody doesn't stay the way that he is now. Change him, please, Jesus. I'm giving you insight into her prayer life. But uh, we all have to grow. We all have to change. But it happens in grace. Next is unity in all our leadership decisions as we align with God's heart and mind. Unity in all of our decisions, in all of our leadership 
decisions as we align ourselves with God's heart and mind. We want to align with God's heart. Now, what I mean in unity in our decisions is really through our elder board. We are elder-led at Christ Chapel. That means we have 10 men who meet the qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 who are the leaders of our church. Our elder board, that's my boss. That, that's who I look to. That's who leads me because they lead our church. And every decision that they make is 10 to zero. It's unanimous. They are unified in every decision. We never make a decision that's nine to one, eight to two, seven to three, six to four. We never move forward without everyone. Everyone has to be on the same page. And this happens a lot through prayer. Men get on the same page through prayer because we believe that if we're asking one God, one question, we should get how many answers? One, we should get one answer. And if we're not hearing the same answer, maybe we need to go back and continue to ask God. We just start back at the beginning. Ask one God, one question. And we're gonna ask one God, one question until we come up with the same answer. And we all move forward together. And I think this provides a lot of joy for our church. It's a joy to watch as I sit in the elder meetings uh, every other Tuesday night and some special meetings as well. But it's a joy. Uh, Philippians 2.2 says, Paul tells the church, complete my joy. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Our leadership has one mind, unanimity in all of our decisions. And I know that baffles people, but I see it, I watch it. Our, our elders are wonderful men who uh, they do as James tells us to do, to pray for the sick and, and the hurting. Uh, they do things with, in regards to uh, pastoral care and visits, and they do uh, a lot of stuff with, with membership. They certainly make other decisions. You have to meet with the elders if you're ever going to become uh, a member. And speaking of meeting with the elders, the elders are holding a meeting of the membership on September 15th, next Sunday, at 6.30 here in the Fort Worth Sanctuary regarding a church discipline issue. So they exercise church discipline as well. These are wonderful men who lead our church. And one of the things that they look for in, when they ask God and they look for God's leading is they look to how God provides as well. And that's another core value we have is debt-free decision-making to follow God's leading as he provides. Debt-free decision-making to follow God's leading as he provides. We believe that if God is in it, then God will provide for it. Constitutionally, we cannot borrow money from anyone. We cannot go into debt for anything. So everything you see is paid for, praise God. That we, we, can't, we can't go into debt, which allows us a lot of freedom to follow God. Um, Philippians chapter four, verse 19 says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He will supply every need. If he's not supplying for it, then maybe that was a want because he's gonna give us everything he needs to continue his mission for us as a local church to distribute him. He's gonna provide for it. That's what the scripture tells us. And so we look to him to always provide for everything we need. So praise God, we, we don't have any debt, and that comes through your generosity. You have to give for this core value to take place. And what it allows us to do is freedom to step into immediate needs. That's what's cool. Is, folks, none of us know what's around the corner. But if you are giving faithfully as unto the Lord, then you are freeing us to be able to step into an immediate need like a hurricane a hurricane that there needs to be financial aid and relief to folks that are hurting and who need their lives restored, and we go, we're there. We can meet that need. We're free to step into that immediately and be Monday morning relevant because we're not hanging on to debt. We say, well, we can't because we've got this debt back here that we gotta pay off. So it allows us to follow God freely and follow God quickly as well. And then finally, striving for excellence in all we do because all we do is for the Lord. Striving for excellence in all we do because all we do is for the Lord. It, everything we do is for the King. And that's not the King Elvis, it's the King Lord Jesus. 
Everything we do is for him. Uh, Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. I love you. I told you that you are our highest value. You growing spiritually is our highest value. But the reason why we do what we do is for the Lord. And that's the reason why you should do what you do is as unto the Lord. Because if you, here's, here's why this fits in with excellence. Because if we're doing it for the Lord, we do our best. If we're doing it for other people, we do enough to get by. You do enough that they won't, they won't notice that. You know, we can just do that. Uh, Let me give you a very concrete illustration here, a very cold illustration, actually. There is ice in this ice chest. Why? (laughs) Why does it matter that there's ice in this ice chest? I mean, I'm just pulling these bottles out. Do we we need ice here? I I argued with the team about it. I'm just being honest with you. I argued with the team about it. I'm like, we don't need ice in there. And you know what? They said, Cody, we're not working for you. We're working for the Lord. <laughs> but they wanted these to look cold. And so if, if you can see them glistening <laughs> as if they're cold, that's why they did it. You want to clap for that, Vince? That's fine. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> because excellence is about effort. Excellence is about effort and giving the Lord our best. That's why we desire to be excellent. Reminds me of Romans 12, one. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, because you see what God has done for you, offer yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Because I see what he's done for me and all he's given to me, I wanna give him my best. Doesn't matter, good enough isn't good enough. It doesn't matter. I'm not trying to do enough to get by just so that I get by with you because I have to stand in front of the Lord and I'll be held accountable to him and he's gonna go, Cody, did you give me your best? Yeah, Lord, I I gave you my best. Even though I didn't want them to put ice in the ice chest, but you know, but they were doing their best. And at Christ Chapel, we're gonna do our best for the Lord because he deserves it. That's who he is. Christ is classic. (laughs) He's classic Now we just need to distribute him in a classic way. These are our core values as Christ Chapel. So 